Hello, everyone, and welcome to Equity to Justice, um, Reimagining Strategies for Community-Driven Solutions. Thank you again for joining us. Just a few housekeeping reminders. So today's webinar will be recorded and provided to registrants within a week from today. Um, you are muted to ensure sound quality, but please engage us. Use the questions box to ask us questions um, and leave comments and also talk to us on Twitter. Um, have a conversation with us and engage us. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, please email gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. And we want you to just join from a comfortable space, join from a quiet place, um, and really get comfy to take in all of the great information that we have prepared for today. Uh, feel free to grab a warm drink or some coffee or a snack. I know that's perfect for us. We're in Washington, DC, and it's a bit rainy and dreary today. Again, engage us. Um, use questions and comments as you listen. And tweet us on Twitter using the hashtag Camp Prosperity. And reflect on ways that you can learn today so you can either undergo some paradigm shifts maybe confirm some fundamental beliefs um, but thank you again for joining us and without further ado i'm going to hand things off to vanna cure great thank you so much olivia and welcome back everyone to week three our final week of camp prosperity 2022 um, last week if you were with us for the series, you know that we continued this series with permission to engage, where we discussed how you all can equip ambassadors to advocate for change. If you missed that session by chance, you can check it out uh, via yesterday's camp newsletter that should have been sent to your email inbox. So check that for a link to the recording. Uh, as Olivia mentioned, this week we'll be focused on how we turn the word equity into actionable solutions. Uh, we'll explore what equity means, why it's a popular buzzword to use now, and how we turn it into actionable solutions that all communities, so that all communities, excuse me, can achieve justice and thrive. Uh, we'll also share strategies for advancing policies and programs that center on the individual community's unique uh, capacities and needs. Um, and so as you can see on the next slide here, this is sort of where we've gone, the three webinars that, or the two webinars that we've had prior to today. As I mentioned, you can check those out um, in your email inbox for links to those recordings. As Olivia mentioned as well, we also want you all to engage with us. And one incentive for doing so is that you can win a prize. Um, if you've been with us for the last several weeks, you know that um, there are several ways for you to win prizes throughout this series. Um, you can uh, tweet with us, use the hashtag Camp Prosperity as you see there on your screen. We'll announce the top tweeter at the end of this, uh, at the end of today's webinar. So definitely tweet. Um, use that hashtag. Don't just maybe retweet or don't just uh, tweet out the hashtag, it, uh, the hashtag itself. But if you hear some quotes that you like, if you'd like to ask us questions via Twitter, those are the things that we'll look for. And like I said, we'll award a, a small prize to the top tweeter at the end of the webinar. Another way that you can win a prize is uh, through our pop quiz, which you all tend to love. We'll do that at the end of today's webinar. I'll ask a question. The first person to type it into the questions box will win a small prize from Prosperity Now. So definitely uh, take a few notes as you're listening in, pay attention, and, and really take in what the speakers are presenting. We've got a great lineup for you uh, that I'll introduce in just a second. And then the final way to win a prize is by completing our post-webinar survey. While this is the last uh, and final webinar of this Camp Prosperity series, we do want to hear from you and help to help us improve Camp Prosperity moving forward. So please fill out that survey. Let us know what you think about what you thought about today's Camp Prosperity session, and you'll be entered for a chance to win a small prize from us. Last week's survey winner is Louisa Estanga. So Louisa, if you're on the call today, look out for an email from Prosperity Now with your prize in it. So thank you for filling out last week's survey. I want to introduce today's speaker for you. I'm really excited for the conversation today. It should be another great one. Uh, we'll start off by hearing from Erin Hurley in just a second, who is the Director of Government Affairs at NACO, National Association of Counties. Uh, Lauren Beeler, who is my colleague here at Prosperity Now, who serves as our Associate Director for State and Local Policy, will moderate a wonderful panel uh, featuring Erin, as well as Skylar Laramore, who is the first Deputy Director of Policy for the Mayor's Office for the City of Chicago, and Devante Lewis, who is the Director of Public Affairs and Outreach at the Louisiana Budget Project. We will hear from our speakers in just a moment, but want to go over the agenda for you all really quickly here. Um, I'm going to do a poll question in just a second to get a sense of who all who is on today's call. And then I'll turn it over to Aaron to talk through state and local uh, coronavirus fiscal recovery funds. 
And then we'll go into our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Lauren, where we will discuss equity to justice. Um, and as always, we will end off with a, a large Q&A group discussion. But as always, if you all have questions throughout the, the webinar, please feel free to type them into the questions box and I'll add them to our panelists as we go along. So before I turn it over to Aaron, I want to get a feel for who is on today's webinar. If you will take a moment to fill out our poll question and our poll question for today is what is your role within your organization? Assuming that many of you, most of you are joining, uh, representing your organizations, what's your role there? Is it policy and advocacy, communication, development or fundraising, leadership role or program? If you will take a moment to fill out this poll question, help our speakers get a sense of who they are talking to today. Take a moment to fill that out and I'll read out the responses here in just a second. It looks like most of you do policy and advocacy work, which is really great for this conversation. 57% of you do policy and advocacy, followed by 35% of you uh, are in programs, another 31% in leadership, followed by communications and then development and fundraising. So we've got a wide variety here, but a little over half of you do policy and advocacy, which is great to know. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Erin Hurley to get us started with her presentation. Um, but just a level set there, I know that this conversation is about equity. Um, and, and, you know, when we think about equitable solutions, many states and municipal governments right now are still trying to figure out how to spend their COVID relief dollars from the American Rescue Plan. And of course, this presents a great opportunity uh, to advocates to focus on ways that these dollars could be used to advance equity in your respective communities. Um, and so that's what Aaron will sort of level set and talk to us about first in this uh, Camp Prosperity series. So I'll turn it over to Aaron to talk a little bit more about these ARPA dollars and how they can be used in your community. Aaron. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vanna, for that introduction and for Prosperity Now for inviting me to be here today. Again, Aaron Hurley, I serve as the Director of Government Affairs at the National Association of Counties, which represents all of the nation's 3,069 county governments. So as Vanna mentioned, uh, what I will be discussing today is first and foremost, the U.S. Department of Treasury's uh, final rule for the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, which was, of course, authorized under the American Rescue Plan Act um, in March of 2021, uh, and highlight, you know, how counties have uh, started to actually invest those dollars to to support their uh, communities and residents, and really put us on. Aaron, I believe we lost you for a second. We may I, have lost. I don't you. think I'm seeing. You you lost me. Yes, if you'll maybe turn your video off, I think that will give a little bit more bandwidth. Turn what? Oh, turn the camera off. Yes, definitely. Yep. All right. How about now? If you if we can hop to the next slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, so just kind of at a 30,000 level kind of view, um, looking at the state and local fiscal recovery fund. So again, the fund itself in total was $50 billion and that was allocated to states, counties and cities uh, with the states receiving the largest uh, portion of the recovery funds. And then in terms of the county uh, and city allocations, uh, counties received $65.1 billion, so that was in direct funding to every single uh, of those 3,069 counties, parishes, and boroughs. And then another $65.1 billion was allocated to cities, uh, with the largest cities receiving direct allocations and smaller cities receiving uh, sub-allocations. So in terms of after the money has been dis distributed, or actually how it's being administered, it is being administered in two, two separate so the first tranche contains the first half of 
the total ARP recovery fund allocation. And then that second tranche contains that, that remaining 50%. So now that we kind of know how the money was actually administered and distributed, let's kind of talk about the, the four key categories that recipients are allowed. Sorry, Vanna, can we jump to the next slide? Great, thank you. Uh, so one of the very first categories um, in terms of eligible uses is around uh, replacing lost revenue. We know that this was a huge um, issue that states and localities faced as a result of small business closures, uh, increase in expenditures as well when, when addressing uh, the public health crisis. So there was a significant amount of lost revenue. We found actually just in a study that we conducted for counties that counties faced um, a, a around uh, two, 200 uh, uh, million dollar uh, loss in revenue. So what that means is under the final rule, uh, en entities were allowed to use the recovery funds to replace that lost revenue. Um, what was a very significant difference between the interim final rule that was released and the final rule was that in the final rule, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, allowed um, allowed uh, uh, recipients to allocate up to uh, $10 million in lost revenue um, and, and claim a, a standard allowance. So what that means is that uh, they some entities, depending on what exactly they wanted to do, they were actually allowed to simply just uh, claim that $10 million revenue loss standard allowance and then actually use it for any sort of government service, um, which if we hop to the next slide, I can kind of talk a little bit more, more about those eligible uses. Perfect, thank you so much. So in terms of those eligible uses, um, what, what that really means is that the Department of Treasury, what they did is that they pro provided an explanation of what government services were. So these are services that traditionally any sort of local government would be able to uh, provide in their normal day-to-day -day functions. Um, and so the Department of Treasury outlined, as you can see on that bulleted list right there, they actually outlined some examples in terms of what government services can be used for. And I do want to stress that this is actually just kind of a, you know, just examples. But when you're talking about revenue loss and how you can use those dollars, this is absolutely the most flexible uh, area within the final rule. So as you can see, uh, recipients can use the funds for constructions of schools and hospitals, uh, road building and maintenance, healthcare services, and so on. Um, but there are really kind of only four limitations in which recipients can use those recovery funds. So namely, you can't use the funds uh, for uh, debt service, um, you can't use them for extraordinary contributions into a pension fund, and then you also can't use them for rainy day funds. But but again, this is definitely the most flexible um, section within Treasury's final rule and how recipients can use those dollars. And then if we can hop to the next slide, please. So beyond the, um, the revenue loss section within the final rule, um, recipients also can use the funds to address public health and negative economic impacts as a result of the pandemic. Um, so what Treasury did in the final rule um, is that they first provided they first provided uh, an additional list of enumerated eligible uses. So what that really means is that they outlined all of the eligible ways in which um, recipients can use these, uh, these, these dollars to support the public health uh, response, uh, whether it be around COVID-19 mitigation, um, health equity, and so on. Um, and then they also provide an, ex an explanation of how you can address the negative economic impacts. So what they specifically did is that they actually defined what an impacted population was versus a disproportionately impacted population um, and all of the accompanying eligible uses of those funds. Um, so it, 
they, you know, they provided a specific uh, annual income threshold, which differentiated between impacted and disproportionately impacted, and those services and support associated with those as well. Beyond households, they also did this for small businesses as well as nonprofits uh, as well too. And then if we could jump to the next slide. Also within the public health and negative economic impacts section within the final rule, uh, what Treasury did is that they uh, provided additional clarification in terms of what type of support you can provide to impacted industries. So specifically, these impacted industries are uh, traditionally either travel, tourism, or hospitality. We know, of course, that those sectors specifically got hit very hard uh, because of the pandemic. And so what they did with the final rule is that they first and foremost, uh, I, you know, provided clarification on how to actually identify or designate an impacted industry. So traditionally those three different sectors, uh, but also recipients do have the flexibility uh, in terms of uh, identifying additional sectors that, that were impacted outside of the travel, tourism, and hospitality sectors. So meaning if you can demonstrate that there was, um, you know, a, a higher impact of unemployment of other sectors, you would also be able to provide aid to those sectors as well. Then within the public sector capacity, um, this this is a very significant, a lot of significant, significant clarification uh, from Treasury within this kind of subsection. So what you can do with these, these dollars is actually rehire um, staff from either, you know, a, a local government, it could either be, you know, private or public sector, um, you can hire staff to pre-pandemic levels. So whatever, the, whatever those staff levels were prior to January 27th of 2020, um, of course, when the public health emergency was declared, in addition to those same uh, levels, uh, you know, those, those equivalent pre-pandemic levels, under the final rule, um, recipients also have the ability to hire up to 7.5% above those pre-pandemic levels. So very, very helpful in terms of that, especially as we know kind of the, the, the huge impact that the, especially the public sector workforce is facing right now in terms of shortages. And then finally, you can also use the funds for any sort of staff retention, uh, avoid layoffs. You can also provide compensation to previously furloughed workers as well too. And then finally, in terms of capital expenditures, um, there was a lot of clarification in terms of what sort of eligible projects you can use these recovery funds for uh, to respond to the pandemic. So it could be constructions of schools, hospitals, um, affordable housing, either permanent or temporary. Um, so there is a lot of clarification in terms of eligible uses around that. And then also some additional requirements um, in terms of reporting uh, for those capital expenditures if they uh, uh, exceed a, a certain uh, a certain um, dollar amount as well too. If we could jump to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to again highlight the restoring the public health capacity since it, it this is very significant. So um, getting down into kind of a little bit more of the weeds, you can still cover payroll and cover benefits for public safety, public health, healthcare. Uh, human services and other similar employees, as I mentioned before, using the funds to rehire up to your pre-pandemic levels or above pre-pandemic levels with that 7.5 growth, growth allowance. Um, and then also, again, to make sure that you are retaining your, your workforce, you can also provide additional compensation to the, those employees as well. If we could jump to the next slide, please. Thank you. And then premium pay. Um, what premium pay is, um, is for, for folks that are joining that are, aren't as familiar with this, is that it's an, addi an additional $13 per hour on top of an individual's regular hourly rate or providing a lump sum of up to $25,000 per person. So what Treasury did is that they actually outlined um, what types of employees would be eligible for premium pay. This is typically, think of a you know, an individual that was working throughout the pandemic, uh, they had to have been actually having interactions, in-person interactions with individuals or physical handling of items. This is, I guess, first and foremost, most significant to counties. This can be any sort of um, uh, state or local government employee. Um, but beyond that, they do provide, Treasury does provide a very, very long list of other individuals that are eligible to receive premium pay. 
Um, so what the final rule does is that, again, it just clarifies who, who is actually eligible to receive premium pay, um, but also how these recipients can actually administer it, whether it be um, in, a, in a lump sum or quarterly, monthly installments, um, they can, and how, and the fact that uh, premium pay can be awarded to hourly, part-time, or salaried or non-hourly workers as well too. And then finally, uh, one last item that is very significant is that volunteers were also uh, explicitly um, barred from receiving premium pay as well too. If we could jump to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and then the these last um, two slides for just the, the specifically the eligible uses portion. Um, so broadband infrastructure, of course, um, we know that the pandemic really highlighted the digital gap uh, that we have across the country um, as folks were either working from home or, or students were, you know, um, trying to uh, go to school from home as well. So under the final rule uh, and what recipients can do is use these recovery funds to address that um, digital gap. So what you can use the funds for is um, investing in projects that would provide a reliable wireline um, of 100 megabits download and 20, minute, tw 20 megabits upload speed. So that was a little bit of a difference between the interim final rules. So recipients do have more flexibility in the types of projects that they can actually invest in as well too. Um, so we were really happy to see that additional flexibility. And then recipients can also use the recovery funds to invest in any sort of uh, modernization of cybersecurity for existing and new broadband infrastructure as well too. If we could jump to the next slide, please. Um, and then finally, in terms of the reporting requirements, I did just wanna highlight for, for folks, since we do continue to receive a lot of questions around what these reporting requirements look like. Um, so how the frequency in which a recipient actually submits a report is based upon their population threshold, as well as the total ARP allocation they received. So recipients that either have a population of 20, 250,000 residents and above, or received $10 million in total recovery funds, um, they will be reporting on a quarterly basis. So for, for those recipients that are reporting on that quarterly basis, there's actually a report that's due at the end of this month. It's called the Project and Expenditures Report. Um, and what it really entails is, you know, these recipients are reporting out on how they are investing these dollars to the Department of Treasury. Um, and the portal itself is actually separated into seven kind of overarching categories. Um, and then uh, recipients will actually put the dollar amount, how they're administering those funds to subrecipients as well too. For the annual project and expenditures reports, uh, this applies to recipients that have a population of 250, below $250,000 and then also received less than $10 million. And then the, finally, the recovery plan performance report. Um, those only apply to recipients that have a population of 250,000 or above. And these are much more detailed reports um, that both look, you know, in the past year of how recipients have been investing those dollars, but also for, very much so forward thinking as well too. Um, so the, those uh, performance plans, not only do recipients have to publish those to the, uh, you know, send them into the Department of Treasury, they actually also have to upload them on their county websites as well too. If we could jump to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. So now let's turn, and I, I know I'm, uh, I'll, I'm just gonna go through these next couple of slides fairly quickly, um, but looking at how counties are actually investing recovery funds. So what NACO has been doing for about the last year now, um, now that counties uh, have their first tranche of funds, there are actually only six counties out of, out of all of those 3,069 counties that um, have already received their first tranche. Many of those have actually received their second tranche. NACO has conducted a study um, looking at how counties are actually investing those dollars. So as you can see, um, it's all across the board, investing in health programs, human services, uh, and, and services to support children and family. We see a lot of transportation and infrastructure, including specifically water and sewer infrastructure, and so on. So all of this analysis actually comes from those larger 
um, counties that submitted that, that project and expenditure report, the quarterly project and expenditure reports. So we have done an, an analysis of that and have found those numbers in this way. If we could jump to the next slide, please. And then this is finally, this slide just, again, kind of really just highlights all of the different areas um, counties are investing those dollars. So um, as I mentioned before, using the funds to expand vaccine equity clinics and outreach, uh, provide mental health support to not only seniors, but to, to all residents. That's been a huge emphasis um, in terms of providing mental health services um, to residents across the country that we've seen counties heavily invest in. Um, we also know that they're using these dollars to provide affordable housing to residents. That's also a major area that, that we've seen over the last um, probably six months of we, as we've been conducting these studies. Um, we also have seen counties um, using these dollars um, to really kind of bolster up the public health workforce as well too as we know that that has been dwindling not even just throughout the pandemic but even prior to the pandemic so again this is just a snapshot of how uh, counties have been um, investing the recovery funds or will continue to for the next several years if we could jump to the next slide please and then finally um, in closing i just wanted to highlight that naco has been working with the national league of cities and uh, brookings metro to actually develop what we're calling the local government arpa investment tracker so all of this data that we are receiving um, and highlighting it's an incredible dashboard it actually highlights the amount of uh, dollars that have actually been budgeted for so that's either expenditures or actually money that has been fully spent um, the number of projects that we know that are going are being funded with the ARPA recovery funds. Um, and you can actually search by state, by county, and see exactly how the, those dollars are being spent. All of this data within the ARPA investment tracker is coming from the project and expenditure reports that have been submitted to the Department of Treasury. So the Department of Treasury, uh, over the last couple of months now, it, it's actually been two two separate times, they've released the data that they've received through their reporting portal. Um, and it breaks down exactly the dollar amount that is being invested to these invested in these different types of projects and a description of those projects as well. So our NACO and Brookings and NLC um, have been working together to get all of this information on this investment tracker. So it's an incredible, incredible tool to actually see what local governments are doing across the country with these dollars and kind of, you know, where they are, where they are in terms of implementation. Um, next slide, please. Great. Well, well, that that is it uh, for me in terms of eligible uses and and how we kind of have been tracking in terms of how counties have been investing those dollars. I apologize about uh, the the internet connection, but um, thank you again, and Vanna, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, hopefully, you all enjoyed that presentation as much as I did. I know that there's been such an emphasis with advocates on advocating for um, ARPA dollars and getting some of those funds to support some programs in the community, but there's not really been a whole lot shared about, you know, sort of guidance that's been placed on counties, some of the reporting requirements. So I really appreciate that, Erin. I hope that you all took as many notes as I did and got a lot out of that conversation. I want to take a quick second to um, get to the questions box. I see a question here uh, from Carmela. I'm going to ask one question, but if you all in the audience have more questions for Erin, we'll circle back after the panel to get those answered. Um, Aaron, question for you. Do recipients of these dollars have to fulfill all seven categories to qualify and the opportunity to fulfill those performance objectives must, who must fulfill them? And then second piece of that is the decision to receive those allocations contingent upon being able to fulfill those categories for metrics? Um, so, and, and definitely the, the individual that submitted this question, feel free to enter, enter in a follow-up question if I'm not totally uh, understanding it. But in order to receive the recovery fund dollars, you, you don't have to demonstrate that you would be able to uh, spend the money in, those, in any sort of like specific category um, that was authorized under the American Rescue Plan. So just the four broad categories are revenue replacement, water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, 
public health and negative economic impacts, and premium pay. So in order to receive those dollars, you do not have to demonstrate to the Department of Treasury that you would automatically be you know, spending in any sort of specific category. These funds were automatically distributed to states and localities. The only entity that did not receive a direct dis distribution from the Department of Treasury, they're called non-entitlement non units, NEUs for short. Um, so again, you don't have to, before receiving an allocation, you don't have to demonstrate that, that you are, that you're able to invest these funds in a specific area. After you receive those dollars, that's when you would brainstorm ways in which you would actually invest those dollars. Simply, all you have to do is make sure that your, um, your government is complying with, uh, the eligible uses, uh, put forth in the Department of Treasury's final rule, and then of course uh, with the reporting requirements that Treasury has also uh, released as well. I hope that was a helpful answer, but but happy to expand on any any kind of point within that. Thanks, Erin, and definitely enter a follow-up question um, if you do have one. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to hold off on asking you any more questions, Erin. We'll circle back at the end of our, our panel discussion. But I want to introduce our panelists. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a, a panel discussion. I'm going to turn it over to our great moderator, Lauren, Lauren Belor. Uh, Aaron will continue to join us for the panel discussion along with Skylar Laramore from the uh, mayor's office at the city of Chicago and Devante Lewis from the Louisiana Budget Project. So I will turn it over to Lauren to moderate our panel discussion this afternoon. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Vanna, um, for turning over to me. As Vanna mentioned, my name is Lauren Belor, and I am the Associate Director of State and Local Policy with Prosperity Now. And we're so delighted to have um, this dynamic group of leaders and experts um, around policy and who will definitely help to drive the dialogue today around taking that, that buzzword of equity and really adding some community driven and community action solutions um, to have great and successful policy come out of that. And so um, for starters, we're going to talk about equity and what it actually looked like, what looks like. And um, I want to start with this question and um, following the question, just have each of you feel free to introduce yourselves a little further, a little more about your background and role. Um, but in some ways, equity has indeed become a buzzword. We know it's used every day. We know everyone is um, using it uh, just as quickly as they were using woke at some point. Um, and so as much as it's being talked about, um, we want to kind of dive into um, how we actually identify and define real equity. So I'm going to start with um, Skylar for this question. And again, please feel free to introduce yourself a little more. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be in conversation with you today. Thank you so much for our attendees for hopping on. Uh, I'm Skylar Laramore. I'm the first deputy director of policy within the city of Chicago, I'll be chief of policy starting next Monday. Um, so in my role, my team is about 11 people within the mayor's office, and we very much are the mayor's sort of right-hand folks to think about the forward-looking policy agenda for specific ordinances and policy changes that she should be making as a progressive leader in Chicago. Our portfolio is rather wide-ranging, so staff on our team work, from, work on anything from gender-based violence reform policy all the way to inclusive economic growth and community development. Uh, but we think a lot about not just the outcomes of our policy decisions, but the process of formulating our policies side by side with community residents and advocates. So excited to be here to illuminate some of that. I do have one slide um, and our next, uh, if you want to click to that. And this just shows a little bit about how the city of Chicago formally, formally defines equity. And so if your city or county does not do this, this is a perfect place to start of asking them how specifically do you define this and put it on your website publicly so that we can hold you accountable to it. The city of Chicago, in partnership with our Office of Equity and Racial Justice and our chief equity officer, uh, came up with this de definition side by side with her stakeholder groups of advocates, organizers, and researchers and residents. Um, and you'll see that it's pretty comprehensive. So we're in Chicago thinking about equity as both an outcome and a process. 
In terms of an outcome, it's a future state that we strive to create where identity and social status no longer predestine life outcomes. And within that, acknowledging the severe impact that systemic racism has had to create harm at the individual, institutional, and structural levels. And the process piece here is critical. So we understand that what equity and process means is that we are prioritizing access and opportunities to groups that have had the greatest need or have been disproportionately impacted. Most often our Black, Latino, and low-income residents. We are method, 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 methodically evaluating benefits and burdens produced by seemingly neutral systems and practices. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the course of this panel, but how we use data to drive actual more equitable outcomes. And lastly, thinking about how we are engaging those that are most impacted by problems to address um, in the in uh, to seek to address the problems that we're seeking to solve as a city. And so that means, you know, residents are experts in their own experiences. They're strategists in co-creating solutions and they are evaluators of success. So throughout the course of the panel, I'll talk about ways that we actually take this definition and we make it live in the course of the work we do in the mayor's office. Thank you so much, Skylar. And Devante, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the same question and again, a brief intro um, about your background. Hi, yes, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Devante Lewis. I am the Director of Public Affairs and Outreach at the Louisiana Budget Project. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, policy think and do tank uh, that works on issues that affect low and moderate income Louisianians. But we are part of a national network of state organizations that some of you uh, may know in your state um, that is under the Economic Policy Institute and the EARN Network, as well as uh, the State Priorities Partnership um, under the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in DC. Um, so really glad to be here. Uh, when I think about equity, uh, as you said, Lauren, it is very much a buzzword. And so um, I, I've really changed it to say, I, I, I really evaluate your work, not whether or not you say you're in, in favor of racial equity, but whether or not you take a racial justice lens. I'm going to make a distinction between the two. Uh, for me, racial equity is just analyzing data and information about race and ethnicity, uh, looking at the structural causes of problems, and then understanding the disparities and the reasons they exist, but explicitly naming um, the race when you talk about problems and solutions. Um, and that's what we've done, right? But I don't think that's transformational. That is not actually rebuilding and dismantling the system of white supremacy. So I add a second tenet to that, which is the racial justice lens, where we understand and acknowledge um, the past racial history of our country and of our states, where we are creating um, visions of an inclusive society and where we're looking at transformational changes in our civic and political power, where we are giving those power to the most impacted individuals um, and those close proximity to the harm that seeks. Um, and so uh, for me, that's how I define racial equity, whether or not you are coming on to the transformation of multiple systems that have led to the, the disparities that we see in our nation and in our state today. And so, I mean, I think that is the way how I approach uh, racial equity uh, by turning it from equity only, but to a lens of justice, because we know our society will not improve if we are not committed to justice, because just acknowledging the problem is not going to actually solve the problem. Thank you so much, Devante. Um, definitely um, some layered pieces there. And um, wrapping this up, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron again. Um, to answer this question and also feel free to add any additional information, um, although you already presented, but feel free to add additional information about your background as well. Great, Th thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so so in terms of, uh, of this question, um, so, and, and again, just kind of speaking from the, from the county lens, um, I think, you know, what, what NACO has been doing and in coordination with our memberships, when, when thinking about the county role when it comes to defining equity, uh, promoting equity, is looking at how counties really play a critical role in kind of building those vibrant communities for all individuals as we oftentimes serve as the safety net for, for low income and indigenous residents and really kind of carry out a lot of those critical local functions like economic development and, and public safety oversight. Um, really what 
counties have been focusing on and how to define equity is and ensure that all residents have what they really need to carry out their fullest potential uh, is supporting things like uh, employment opportunity and access to health care, uh, nutritious food and, and affordable housing. And so we've seen a lot of county leaders really trying to integrate diversity, equity, equity and inclusions into those county operations as well. Um, I, I will just note that we at NACO have actually developed a uh, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, cohort uh, among our membership. Um, and a lot of these county leaders have really been calling attention to injust, uh, injustices across the country and articulating how these injustices produces poor outcomes in minority populations and, and to economic growth and employment, health and, and really well-being throughout, throughout the country as well too. So um, I, I think my, my colleagues, uh, Skylar and Devante, have really provided a great overview, but, but wanted to kind of specifically look at look at the county lens and maybe and later in, in the panel discussion we can talk about specifically how counties have been using those American Rescue Plan Act dollars also to to support uh, um, uh, and and implement an equity lens as well thank you so much Erin I think that kind of rounds out um ways to address the process of equity it seems like one entity that was mentioned was about data and then the follow-up to that was also using that data to thus further um, inform conversations about actual racial justice and so um, this kind of leads to the conversation about communicating um, about equity and with many legislators as you know um, they are not always in safe seats um, they're not always in majority progressive legislatures, and so many of them do not want to um, say the thing or name the thing or address the elephants in the room. However, for many community-based organizations that is starting to um, ring a bell on how to actually drive towards accountability um, and transparency, which is needed to address the equity and also um, to pull out that racial justice lens. And so um, how do you communicate the need for equity and policy to legislators who are uncomfortable with discussing it? Um, and I'm going to kick this off with Devante for this question. Yes, I mean, I think that is the the most important part about starting the conversation. And, and I always say to everyone, I think, the way you approach it is you have to be in the business of telling the truth, right? Um, I, I am uh, reminded of uh, Sanford and Son and Aunt Esther when she always said, the truth shall set you free. Um, and I think of that moment and that's how we have to be part of this movement. I, I often see that when we think about policy, um, there is this veil of sometimes that policy is race neutral and that, that you can develop policy in this abstract world where you don't consider race, you don't consider gender, you don't consider sexual orientation, um, and, and that's how it is. But we know the facts that there is no such thing as a race neutral policy. Every policy will have a either positive or negative effect on a racial subsection uh, based off of the structure of the history of how we've developed policy in this nation. I mean, so I think the first way to do it is just starting that hard conversation of truth about how uh, you, you have to analyze race because that's the only way you can figure out whether or not the outcomes of policy is correct or not. Um, I think that the second way you actually like start these uncomfortable conversations is by reminding ourselves that uh, change requires uncomfortability. I think one of the problems sometimes in advocacy is we are always looking for the moment that is less uncomfortable. But if we are trying to grow our nation, if we are trying to grow our society to be more prosperous, to be more inclusive, and to be a true democracy, that means uncomfortable conversations have to happen because you can only get to growth through uncomfortability. Um, and so I think one, we have to embrace that and know that and recognize that uh, and build around having a hard conversation and not around how do we make this um, kind of an elementary um, level conversation within legislatures. Uh, I, I, and lastly, I would say that I think one of the most important things you need to do when you're communicating um, with legislators is connecting uh, the dots home, right? Um, I, I often use this example when I'm trying to explain uh, potentially white privilege or the, or the way whiteness sometimes is the predominant factor in policy um, to legislators. We know sometimes the words 
um, sting and, and it really sets people off. And so what I've tried to do is use just some examples that don't dilute the message, but also enhances people's understanding. So I often say, okay, think about a, a, an application, for example. If I know I have 10 people applying um, uh, for, for a program and I know seven of them have a third grade reading level and, and, and two of them, uh, and the remaining three, excuse me, have a, a college educated level, um, I probably want to write that application on a third grade level, not because I'm diluting it, but so everyone has an opportunity to understand the question and apply. Uh, and when we talk about decentralizing whiteness, it's almost the same tint, that it's not us favoring um, or saying that white people themselves have an advantage, but that whiteness has an advantage. So we need to ensure that when we are communicating and we are building policies, that it is inclusive and everyone has an equal opportunity uh, to either apply for the program, receive those benefits, or benefit from um, the, the, the stimulus or whatever it may be. Um, and so sometimes breaking it down and not using the academic terms, uh, unfortunately, is a way in the door. I um, mean, I think that is the way that we should approach it is, is not trying to find ways to not say things, but how can we say things that really connect? Because once you connect with someone and say, okay, this is why I'm talking about it. This is what I mean when I talk about whiteness as a factor in our society. Um, this is what I mean when I talk about decentralizing um, white supremacy and policy and making sure that we have a, a, an equal uh, playing field, um, then you have a better shot. But, I, but, but lastly, I think just overall, you have to embrace uncomfortability and you can't really get around it. Uh, and once you recognize that, then you have better and more fruitful dialogues with elected officials. Thank you, Devante. And I think if we've learned anything um, in this post-COVID era, but just in the past two to three years in general, um, is that one, we do have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And also um, that relatability and connection is kind of the really the driving force for power building in communities. So um, Aaron, definitely wanna give the same question to you and get your perspective on communicating um, equity to legislators. Yeah, absolutely. So Devante was perfect in his, his response to that, absolutely. Um, I mean, it is all about truth, right? I mean, the 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 pandemic, pre, you know, again, really, really highlighted exactly what was happening all across the country. Um, and something that I think um, in terms of communicating with local leaders, as I mentioned, you know, NACO has created our DEI cohort and has come out with a lot more materials in educating uh, policymakers about DEI and, and the need for it when you are developing these policies. Um, as part of that as well too, what um, uh, as part of that as well too is not only communicating uh, what's happening across the country and, and, and why it's needed, is that what NACO has been doing is um, really digging into our research um, and using our research department uh, to highlight what what has been happening across the country, whether you know it's it's housing, employment, uh, workforce, it's you know addressing barriers to economic pr prosperity, um, supporting uh, the justice involved populations, and, and so on. Um, so coupling both that data component as well as highlighting some kind of key messages um, is is what we we've been working for when, when working with specifically county county elected officials. Another item, a resource that actually NACO created as well too, um, is we created a glossary uh, of DEI terms. And, and I know that sounds a, a little bit basic, but I think that um, there, there's varying, you know, varying degrees to which, you know, folks are familiar with, with these terms. And so really kind of starting at, you know, that kind of introductory level for for some folks, and I think getting them more comfortable with the, with with the concept, um, and also highlighting all of the other work that counties are doing across the country. We know that at this point there are hundreds um, of resolutions across the country. There there are county resolutions um, that counties actually have have come out with over the last. Um, several years or so. And so again, NACO's elevating those resolutions on our website and all of our resources, again, to for other local leaders to become familiar uh, with these terms, what other counties are doing across the country uh, as well. So I really think that it's, it's making folks first aware, again, telling the truth, 
and then educating them and kind of it's almost meeting them on a certain level because again i mean just representing counties from all across the country it's it's, it's unique right in each different county and, and what's really happening so it's kind of coupling all of all of those components um uh but i think it really does start with with that education piece is really 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 critical um and, and something that nico has been working working on with our our local leaders thanks aaron yeah i think to build on your response um i often think about you know i i have a history of doing community organizing prior to my role in the mayor's office and my most immediate role was at a nonprofit organization called the metropolitan planning council that does policy advocacy and research um, and so oftentimes when I think about this question, I think about who is actually the messenger. So thinking about the whole ecosystem of organizations that create racial equity and social change, you have advocates, you have journalists, you have researchers, you have peers in government, you have other cities that have done something transformational. How can you get them in conversation with your local leader? How can you make sure that they see the path um, just by the examples of it being done in another place? Um, I often think too, you know, having been at the Metropolitan Planning Council, about 2017, we did a report that was called the cost of segregation. So it was taking this very, you know, widespread phenomenon that people often identified as intractable, insolvable in Chicago, which is racial and ethnic segregation. If you know Chicago, you know we are a segregated city. Um, and what we did in that report was actually um, concretize by adding in the cumulative impacts to put numbers on the damage of the status quo, what, how it hurts Chicago, our entire city, to be as segregated as we are. Thinking of billions in lost wages, thousands of young people without the education that they need to fulfill their potential, hundreds of lives cut short by violence. So that was an example of a research project that I think has really helped shape the narrative here in Chicago, where now policymakers can have conversations with aldermen and with uh, you know senators that represent more affluent neighborhoods and think about, okay, you know, we can't just keep on keeping on, like what do we do that actually challenges the status quo to make sure that every community is contributing to the need for inclusive, accessible, affordable housing. It's no longer a matter of uh, if we will build affordable housing, it's a matter of how. And I think building on the work of advocates and researchers, they helped us have the numbers and the stories to drive that kind of conversation to make policy change locally. Thank you both Aaron and Skylar. And I think um, bringing up uh, the conversation, I know Aaron, you brought up uh, barriers to economic prosperity, which leads to the next question, um, getting diving more into uh, what type of specific policy solutions um, are available to get us closer to actually closing the racial wealth gap. And um, Devante, I'm going to pass this question to you first. Absolutely. I think oftentimes when we talk through about the racial wealth gap, we focus solely on, on, on employment, home ownership, but there's a place um, that is so much important to the work that I do that I think people don't talk about enough, and that is taxation. Um, I like to say tax policy is racial justice policy, um, and that is because so many of our inequities are established in our tax code. And I'm just going to really briefly just kind of give you a little bit of a history lesson about what I mean by that. Um, so when we think about, for instance, um, the requirements that certain states and counties have where it's a super majority to raise taxes, uh, this really came from the 1890s in, in Mississippi about a constitutional convention where, where black delegates were not permitted. Um, and the author of the first ever super majority of taxation was in Mississippi in 1890, as I said, um, when he presented this amendment to the constitution said, this is partly because I want to ensure that the unpatriotic Negro never has political power to institute taxes on us. And, and so when you think about the way property taxes and sales taxes and income taxes exist, that history is vitally important because that tells us just how much some of this stuff is not race neutral, um, as we said. Um, lastly, I would say when we think about, for instance, property tax, in, 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 in 1895, Alabama put on a property tax limit that is still on its books today. And when you look at the share of, of revenue that is contributed um, in Alabama collected by taxes, property is the lowest in the nation. Um, and then we go to the last tenant, which is sales tax, which is what a lot of counties uh, and cities have moved to because they think it is fair. 
The first sales tax in this nation came in 1932 in Mississippi, where they cut property taxes from mostly white landowners and shifted it to a sales tax, which was about those who consumed the most, which were normally uh, low-income individuals and black individuals in Mississippi, as their primary tax base. So if we really want to close the racial wealth gap, one of the things we have to do is serious tax reform that is ending our dependence on sales tax, which disproportionately hits poor people in our country. It is taxing the rich um, and ensuring that we have an, uh, a very progressive system that when you make more in this country, you pay more in taxes. And it is closing loopholes and deductions that exist in property taxes and in income taxes that allow the rich basically to make more money off of paying taxes than anything else. And so I really think that when we talk about the racial wealth gap, we have to really look at how people are taxed and how we are funding government. Because if you are funding the services that are meant to help the poor with a sales tax, are you really helping them? Because they are the ones taking the brunt of government funding. And so taxation is really key and is a policy solution that we need to focus on if we want to close the racial wealth gap in America. Thank you, Devante. And Skylar, I want to pr present the same question to you um, in regards to closing the racial wealth gap and, and different solutions. Yeah, I actually have a slide um, that we can put up that is the Mayor, Mayor Lightfoot's comprehensive agenda related to our solutions towards ending poverty. It's an agenda she set out well before the pandemic in 2019, and we've only become more dogged in our commitment to addressing the, the, the racial wealth gap through and our measures to in, 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 uh, enhance and afford an inclusive recovery from the pandemic. So some of the pillars of this agenda are bolded, reducing the expenses and costs of being poor. That means what are the ways in which the city as an entity is extracting wealth and actually reinforcing economic hardship through our systems of the way that we generate money for services. I'll talk about some of the measures that we've done to actually uh, you know, roll back many of the regressive systems in Chicago. For example, uh, we, we, at, as soon as the mayor uh, went into office, we put a moratorium on water shutoffs due to non-payment. Non so now you know, no one will ever be cut off from water due to their inability to pay. It's huge, right? We needed that codified in city practice because it's a fundamental human right. The mayor also designed a number of needs-based programs that are income-based, uh, such as our utility billing relief program that provides low-income residents with a 50% rate reduction on water and really enables people to clear mountains of debt that they've been struggling with for many decades in some cases under prior administrations. So those, those are some examples of the way in which cities can actually do this. Cities can challenge the way that they raise revenue and they can do it um, because it 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 is is ethical and it's a it's a more sustainable way for us to make sure that we are um, you know meeting people where they're at and 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 um, challenging our inequitable systems. I'll also um, highlight just a couple other pieces, include uh, increasing quality jobs. Our mayor has a mother who was a care worker, a domestic worker, and so for her that issue is first and foremost given the high rates of exploitation particularly among women of color that are predominantly our care workforce in Chicago, the backbone for so many families and households. So she's done a lot related to raising the floor for worker protections for domestic workers um, that we're extremely excited about. Another tenet of this is, of course, acknowledging the way in which wealth is inextricably tied to health. And so the ways we have to improve health and, ra and racial and ethnic life expectancy um, and, and this illuminates some of the ways that we've done that through community-based solutions that you can see on our website. But I want to um, give one last example, which is on the strategy around fostering wealth building. And so we have taken our American Rescue Plan dollars and actually invested them in a number of extremely innovative solutions. And I'll innovate just, to, or I'll, I'll lift up just two. One is we are investing $15 million in community wealth building pilots. So thinking about not just individual wealth, but shared wealth, community prosperity, of color? How might we expand the prevalence and success of worker co-ops, housing co-ops, community land trust, and community investment vehicles? And lastly, the Chicago Resilient Communities Pilot is the largest guaranteed income demonstration in the country by household served. So as of this month, we're serving $500 a month for 5,000 households for one year. And the reason that we invested in this solution is because we recognize that the most powerful way to 
help folks achieve financial stability and economic mobility is providing unrestricted cash. People know what they need to enable their themselves to thrive, to support their households. And oftentimes our social, social safety net is so restrictive and hard to access that it keeps folks from thriving. And so this program is specifically to supercharge our inclusive economic recovery, to acknowledge and empower individuals to make choices for themselves and their families. So we're excited about the opportunity for innovation and we're evaluating this pilot so that you all advocates all around the country can say, Chicago did it, here's the evidence of how this was powerful for individuals that participated and we need to do it here in our city as well. Thank you, Skylar, for laying out those direct solutions, especially from a city and or municipality um, perspective. Um, and just for some level setting, uh, we have a couple more questions and then we will dive into attendee slash audience questions that have been um, submitted. Um, so for the next question, um, given that we've already laid out um, how to uh, address and access equity, um, but also communicate to uh, legislators, stakeholders, or elected officials about equity. Um, how do we keep individual communities at the center of policy development and advancement? And Devante, I'm gonna turn this question over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the simplest thing is is remembering people come first right i think oftentimes in our work I, 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 from the poll question most of us are in advocacy and policy development uh, we have a tendency to want to assimilate to the current process right we want to have almost what i call a scarcity mindset where we we lose our sight of abundancy because we know that the window of opportunity may be narrow um, and, and so i like to say that we can we need to continue to have a bold policy vision that incorporates incrementalism, but without making incrementalism our goal. And, and that's where we lose people is when we get so focused in the minute minutia of the incrementalism of just like the, the, the basic win that we can get. Uh, I often say our work needs to be centered and building power for the people and not around the people in power, right? And, and so when we commit to that tenet, when we think about policy in that, that framework, and we are abundant with what we are doing, recognizing that we may have to take a half a loaf or a piece of a loaf, we keep, we keep community centered because we say, hey, look, this is, this is good, but our work is not done. But oftentimes, I feel we get trapped where we let the system of power and the people of power dictate how we should bring in community rather than bringing in community and making the people in power be responsive to the power of our people. Thank you, Devante. And Skylar, same question. Yeah, amazing, Devante, thank you. Um, I'll provide one example of how we think about this question within the context of our policy team. Um, so in particular, we just had a huge win last week that we're extremely excited about, which is passing the Connected Communities Ordinance. This specifically was the result of a two, two years of engagement with over 80 community and civic stakeholders to build more truly equitable-oriented development policy in Chicago. So for many years after the first uh, TOD ordinance was passed, 90% of transit-oriented development was happening in predominantly white, predominantly high-income uh, neighborhoods on the north side of Chicago, totally bypassing south and west side communities. So south and west side communities were not experiencing the benefits of new housing construction, the jobs tied to it, they did not have access to retail amenities and opportunities, and the corresponding pedestrian improvements that can happen with new development just were not happening. We also know that TOD you know, has a bad name in Chicago in many ways because it was not done equitably. It was not done in a way that would preserve existing naturally affordable housing stock around that new development. It was not done in a way that would make sure that each on-site development had affordable units inside of it. Um, and so we, side by side with community stakeholders, led a very robust two-year engagement process to actually create an ETOD policy plan equitable transit-oriented development policy plan. Um, and that was even before an ordinance was drafted. This is an example of a time in which, you know, we sat down with developers, we sat down with residents, we sat down with disability advocates, we sat down with, um, and residents themselves and communities that had benefited and never seen TOD and said, what would you like to see in a reformed policy? 
And because that work was done in a way that was rooted with all of those diverse expertise, uh, points of view and data, we were then able to make the case after the ETOD policy plan was drafted to say, this is the roadmap for the ordinance changes that need to happen. So we ended up making really significant 40 pages of modifications to Chicago zoning code. And that coalition of people that had been at the table to shape the policy plan, they were the ones that were the primary advocates with our ward partners along the way. So all the council members, they would call us when we'd have a meeting and they say, oh, we already heard from the coalition. Um, and the, the coalition was activating social media. They were bringing op-eds into the, into the press about why this package needed to pass. They were bringing personal stories with videos and TikToks. And so just use that as, as an example of like, it's not always an opposition where it's like coalitions are only forcing government to act. Obviously that is often the case, but the best case scenario when you have progressive people in power that are working for change, and you all should consider yourselves as people who one day should work in government so that we can play that inside outside game. This Chicago Connected Ordinance is one example of like when you have values driven people that want to co-create policy change and side by side with residents, it's actually more impactful and that's how we make these wins possible. And then those you know, people that were involved in the coalition, they will be holding us accountable to the progress on this actual vision. They over time will ask us for the data of where developments are being built, how it's impacting local affordability, what we're seeing as retail trends. And so we're just honored to be in community um, to have made this win possible. And I think it's a good example of what you all can do locally when you think creatively about what a, a full on cross sector campaign can look like as well. Thank you so much for that example, Skylar. And I think um, as it's so important as we think about uh, when you mentioned values driven people um, that are advocating to co-create that type of change, it's needed when we think about the shift in inclusionary zoning um, and housing affordability, gentrification, et cetera, all these different factors that are happening um, in a lot of um, major cities across the US. Um, moving into, kind of back into the conversation about ARPA. Um, given the multi-year terms of ARPA distribution, government in general, um, budget and term limits, uh, which really uh, plays a role in being able to um, build those relationships and that rapport consistently. Um, how do we ensure accountability over time? Um, and just uh, briefly going to uh, start kick off with Skylar and then just quick responses from you, Devante, and then Aaron. So Skylar, go ahead. Yeah, um, on the next slide, I just um, illuminated some of my quick thoughts and you all will have this in your takeaway when we send out the slides. But, you know, Aaron mentioned a little bit about sort of some of the baseline requirements and expectations that Treasury is required to do, but that's the floor. You all should think about how you should challenge your elected officials to do even more. What are they doing in regards to more detailed public reports and dashboards? What are they doing around oversight structures? Do they create a system for aldermen or your council members to get insight in real time on the status of discrete initiatives? How are those live streams? How are there opportunities for folks to really get those updates much more um, frequently than the treasury reports may require? And just wanna encourage everyone on, on the line to think about what is the baseline data that you are already working with? You know, the, the conditions for residents in individual communities, in your city, in your town, that you can track over time to say, hey, you invested millions of dollars in this community in this way, and we are not seeing any change. That means we need to rethink the allocation of the money in later terms of ARPA. Um, you can see these questions in your own time, but also just want to encourage you all to think about, and we're actively planning this in Chicago, these are multi-year funds, right? And so there may be that the city was not able to hire someone for a salaried budgeted position. It may be that an RFP was slowed down or you have to actually recalibrate and you have some money left over. There will be opportunities. So even if you're sitting on this call and you're thinking, my city or my town already has a plan for ARPA, let's stay diligent, let's ask these questions because there may be opportunities for us if we're doing this right, to recalibrate in real time, knowing that this recovery is gonna be a journey and there's gonna be new needs that arise a year from now that we can't even predict. So how are we holding our elected officials accountable to make those kind of pivots while still stewarding the original intentions of the ARP funds? 
Yeah, those were great realistic points, Skylar, um, to be proactive. Erin, also giving you this question, um, considering all the things you presented as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and Skylar did point to the kind of baseline requirements from Treasury. So I'll, I'll mostly focus, focus on that. Um, so actually within the recovery plan performance report, um, which is required to be posted online, as I mentioned earlier, from from all, and I'll just you know speak for, for for counties, but is required for counties to post that publicly on their website. So that's obviously transparency and and you know accountability as well too. Um, and there are many parts in terms of actually developing that recovery plan performance report that Treasury actually outlines uh, in their final rule in terms of um, an emphasis on community engagement when you are creating your plans, but. Kind of backtracking in regards to that performance report, um, there is an entire section around. Well, I'll just specifically talk about the the equitable outcomes piece. So there's a section in there all around promoting equitable outcomes. Um, so within that section, uh, again, that is publicly posted online. There there are questions that these recipients are required to answer. There's one around goals. So um, are there particularly historically underserved, marginalized, or adversely affected groups that recipients intend to serve within their jurisdiction? There's also an awareness component of that, that recipients have to, a question that recipients have to answer around how um, equitable and practical is the ability for residents or businesses to become aware of these various services that are actually funded by the state and local fiscal recovery fund. And then in terms of access and distribution, um, requiring uh, recipients to look at the different levels of uh, access to benefits um, and services of, of cross groups as well, and making sure that there isn't some, you know, ridiculous uh, eligible, eligible, sorry, excuse me, eligibility criteria to actually receive those services as well too. And then finally, I think this, this is also kind of that accountability accountability piece as well too is what are what are the outcomes that again i'll just speak to counties outcomes that 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 counties are you know working towards so how are the intended outcomes focused on closing gaps or reaching uh you know universal levels of service how is the jurisdiction uh uh disaggregating outcomes by race, ethnicity, and equity dimensions as well too for some sort of like policy uh, objective within their plans. So in terms of the reporting, there is a lot of um, accountability and transparency included in that. Um, but I, I think to Skylar's point as well, I mean, we, we don't know for sure exactly just because uh, you know, a county is saying that they're going to invest these dollars in a certain way doesn't mean that things aren't going to shift. So again, it's making sure that, you know, counties, your your community leaders are um, engaging uh, with residents, um, whether it be through, you know, in a community engagement plan or so on, um, working with nonprofits, et cetera, to have a full kind of picture of how to best and most effectively invest these recovery funds to really make sure that they are supporting all residents and, and communities across the country as well too. But but in terms of the, the treasury reporting piece, there there is there are a lot of requirements associated with that as well uh, for that account, accountability portion. Thank you so much, Erin. And um, this kind of closes out our our conversation before, for today before we go into audience q a just want to first and foremost thank the wonderful panelists for um, being here today and also um just also want to acknowledge that we are moving into a shifting political landscape in this country um it's ever moving and so these are some ways that we can start thinking about uh there's been a lot of protests and a lot of vocal action, we can use these things to move into more of a power building strategy for communities and centering um, equitable policies. So that being said, um, for Q&A, um, there were a few questions that came um, in the box and one that came up that would love to turn over to our panelists um, is how do we combat more conservative courts and how policies are distinctly considered for race due to the equal protection law and the push towards race neutrality when disparity studies are not enough. 
I, I'll, I'll take a first swing at that. I mean, I think first we have to recognize that the courts um, haven't always been the savior, right? I mean, the courts is what gave us uh, Dred Scott and Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, and, and, and then for a period of our, our history kind of redeemed themselves, so to say, um, and now are retreating. I mean, I think one of the places we have to be uh, very vigilant on is judicial elections. Um, a lot of times these cases start in a district or, or, um, or state court um, that are elected judges. And we sometimes just allow judges to be constantly reelected and not challenged, um, not looking at their judicial philosophy and their judicial record. Uh, so one of the things I think we have to add into our work is democracy, right? Um, well, a lot of us are policy organizations. Um, and, and we are faced at this moment, I, I think, as, as the questioner accurately pointed out, in a moment where even the, the theory of democracy as it exists or has, hasn't existed is being challenged. Um, and so that means our work uh, can't solely just be about data, facts, and research on the issues we care about. It has to include the democratic process. Uh, because without the democratic process, there is no policy change. Because if you have uh, radical racial gerrymandering or you have radical activist judges, it, it doesn't matter what we research or what we advocate for because now the system is created in a way where we can't participate or our participation is already excluded. Um, and so I think in this moment when we recognize that there is this move um, towards race neutrality. I think we've seen this particularly in redistricting, the case down here in Louisiana, the case um, in Alabama, Holder uh, versus Shelby County that we saw about 10 years ago that the Supreme Court took when it came to voting rights. There's this belief that, well, we elected Barack Obama and that ended racism and everything uh, is fine. And, and so I think the way that we have to combat that one is back to kind of what I, what I said earlier, uh, is being very honest and open uh, about uh, racial inequities, racial disparities, racial, and how we improve through justice. But it's also ensuring that we are building a, a system where people feel engaged. Um, and, and I'm a big believer in we can't just tell people to vote, right? Because voting alone hasn't solved some of these problems. More people say, well, look, I, I stood in long lines in Georgia for eight years and look at the, look at the system of government I have now. Uh, we have to have our elected officials, the people with power, start to enact um, and be held accountable for the decisions that they make. And those include allies to our organizations. We cannot just look at the people who uh, are naturally opposed to the things we believe. We have to have accountability to the people that say they stand up with us to ensure that they are fighting, to ensure that they are standing up for these truths and values, and to ensure that they're not letting the privilege of being an elected official or the proximity to power dilute the message of what we needed to do. And so I think it's a true focus on democratic participation, but in a way that is beyond the just get out and vote and everything will be better because we know that isn't true. It is going to require dismantling systems and that requires accountability from those who have the key and the hammer to dismantle that system. Thank you, Devante, and thank you for highlighting the intersectionality of different policy issues, democracy, economy, democracy, reproductive justice. They all intertwine when it directly impacts black and brown communities because uh, those are intersectional people. So um, that was very important to highlight. Um, and just kind of moving us along with um, the question and answer portion, um, another question that was asked was specifically for Aaron about what happens to the ARPA funds if they are not spent. Great, Th thank you, Lauren. Um, so the ARPA dollars, so in terms of, of timelines, um, recipients have to obligate all of their funds by December 31st of 2024, but then not actually you know, physically spend the dollars until December 31st of 2026. So if those dollars are not spent by that December 31st, 2026 date, those funds will actually be sent back to the U.S. Department of Treasury. And this kind of goes goes beyond just direct recipients. You know, direct recipients have to make sure that their subrecipients and, and beneficiaries are also spending those dollars as well, too. So again, if any money is not actually out of the door by December 31st of 2026, that money will be sent back to the Department of Treasury. 
One thing that hasn't really come up in this conversation that I do want to lift up is ARPA is just one mechanism that we should be tracking in terms of the equity and implementation. Let's also be on the lookout for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, right? So, and how are, for both of these sources of funding, how are cities actually using this money to distribute them to organizations that may otherwise be typically excluded from government bureaucratic funding cycles, right? And so we're thinking a lot about this in Chicago of how do we make sure that we're not just distributing to the known actors who are our tried and true partners in the ecosystem, but this money is a wealth building opportunity, right? So how do we disaggregate, you know, understanding where our delegates are located, are, are they led by predominantly black and brown leaders in the, in the city? If they are not currently you know, recipients of government funds, what are the barriers to them accessing the kinds of processes that we have? And so just wanna encourage you all to think about that as a tool for change and transformation too. Um, both sort of the outcomes that we see in community for the investments, but also you know, the ecosystem of organizations that we're seeking to support. How do we drive better performance so that more government funding opportunities are accessible for more organizations to drive change in what we're talking about today? Um, and lastly, you know, this is a lot of money going to the creation of new jobs. And so just want to encourage folks to challenge your local municipalities to think about how they are building good jobs with this funding, right? How do we make sure that jobs funded and invest, uh, funded by ARPA are going towards living wage jobs? Um, and, and last call to action is, I'm sure your local municipality has a lot of openings if they're anything like Chicago in terms of open roles, because this is a time where this you know, resource from the federal government has led to a lot of municipal hiring. Um, and it's hard to get folks to commit to a life of service in government. So I just wanna challenge you know, many folks on the call who are in the nonprofit or advocacy space to think about it. I think it's been really illuminating for me as someone who works in organizing to just understand the constraints and pressures that you're operating under in government and how you can use this as a space to realize your vision and values um, and change the way that you lead policymaking processes with equity in mind. Um, and I hope others will consider that in your broader career journey as you're thinking about whether or not government is a fit for you. Thank you so much, Skylar. And we are moving into our portion to um, turn it back over to my colleague, Vanna, um, to discuss uh, some takeaways and next steps from um, the dialogue today. But again, if any additional uh, members of the audience have follow-up questions, please feel free to add it to the questions box and we'll make sure that um, there's some follow-up there um, to get a response to you. Um, ben, I'm going to turn it over to you to wrap us up, um, but thank you again to Aaron, Skyler, as well as Devante um, for leading on this, this conversation that really drives us to a call to action. Um, power building opportunities are there and being leading with equitable messaging is also there. So thank you again. And Vanna, I'm turning it back over to you. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Really enjoyed that great conversation. Um, want, to, want to move us along here um, for one of my favorite parts of Camp Prosperity Pop Quiz and the time where we give out prizes. But before we do that, I know someone asked in the chat for contact information. I'll share that in just a second, so um, please stick around. Uh, before I do a pop quiz question, I want to call out our Twitter winner, um, Midas Collaborative. So whoever is tweeting from the Midas Collaborative, if you will send your email address in the chat uh, box or in the questions box, we'll send you out a small prize from Prosperity Now. Uh, but wanted to do a, a quick pop quiz question to award a prize to one of our audience members. Um, if you all remember the way to win, it's just uh, the first person to type the correct answer into the questions box, uh, we'll send you a small prize. So today's pop quiz question is uh, true or false? Counties may provide premium pay to eligible essential workers. Is that true or false? Erin shared that earlier in the in her presentation, so want to see who was uh, who was paying attention. And the question again is: Counties may provide premium pay to eligible essential workers. Is that true or false? And Jessica Lulong, I think you were first uh, to answer that that was a true statement. Uh, Jessica will send you out a small prize from Prosperity Now. Thank you for uh, answering our pop quiz correctly. Thanks for everyone for for chiming in with the correct answer. Uh, so I want to go move us along here to, to get contact information for our wonderful speakers. Um, feel free to screenshot this. I wasn't aware until very recently that you can screenshot on GoToWebinar. So screenshot this page while we have it up. Feel free to reach out to 
our wonderful panelists, if you have additional questions or thoughts for them, really great information that was shared across the board, and I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, before we wrap up, I've, we've got about five minutes here, but I want to also um, share some next steps with you all. Please uh, fill out our follow-up survey. Like I said, it really helps us to improve camp prosperity year after year, session by session. Added incentive is that we also uh, send a prize. We randomly draw a name and send a prize to someone for uh, who has completed the survey. Also, please register for the Prosperity Summit in this year. Uh, we'll be down in Atlanta, so you'll get a chance to meet myself, Lauren, the rest of the Prosperity Now team, as well as our larger community for a great conference. Um, we do it every other year and will be a wonderful opportunity to meet with other advocates and folks in this field to discuss how we indeed advance equity through actionable solutions. Uh, so please register for that and then explore Prosperity Now's website for additional resources around advocacy. Also wanted to highlight our Prosperity Now Advocacy Center on the next slide. A free resource to you all. Some of you all who may be newer in advocacy wanted to point you all to that. Please sign up for it. It's a way that you can email your MOC stands for Member of Congress, uh, email your legislators, call them, tweet them. You can do that all through this platform. It's free. It's open to the Prosperity Now Advocacy Network. So sign up today um, and send your legislators some emails, give them calls, tweet, tweet at them, so on and so forth. But definitely get started in your advocacy efforts. And then lastly, I invite you all to join uh, or to connect with our Prosperity Now networks. We've got four networks, um, our Affordable Housing Network, our Campaign for Every Kid's Future Network, which focuses on wealth building opportunities for uh, generations, our Financial Security Network, and then our Taxpayer Opportunity Network. So if you are not already a part of our networks, I hope that you all will, will join those. We not only talk policy in those networks, but also programmatic solutions. So they are really great opportunities to connect with your peers. While we have three minutes left, panelists, I am not done with you just yet. I wanted to pause to see if you all had any final thoughts just around the conversation today about uh, advancing equitable solutions. So I will uh, kick it back over to you all for these last three minutes just for some final words for our, our audience today. I'm happy to go. It's been an honor to be in conversation with you, Devante and Erin and Lauren and Vanna. Um, I do just want to share just enthusiasm for all of you. And, and like Devante had noted, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to make our solutions really irresistible. Other cities have done what we're trying to do around challenging the racial wealth gap. Um, other counties have done it. Other countries have done it. We have the resources, let's challenge the sort of scarcity mindset and lean into abundance. And there are real costs for not addressing equity in our society. Um, and lastly, just wanna note, you know, let's I encourage you to develop relationships with people in government because we are not a monolith. And the more that you can sort of leverage power on the inside um, to figure out ways that we can advance change together, um, that's how we're going to move collectively. And lastly, I hope you all consider running for office, working in government, and participating in local dem democracy, as Devante noted. Sometimes the loudest voices that are shaping budget town halls, community meetings for affordable housing, and PTAs, they do not align with the values of many of us on this call. So we have to occupy those spaces if we're going to shift our cities for the more equitable. Yeah. I, I, I... I will echo everything that Skylar just said. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege to, to, to be with you. And I think um, I would tell you just dare to dream, right? We, we oftentimes forget about dreaming of what an inclusive uh, economy, an inclusive society, um, and a society where we all can prosper is. And I think we uh, the challenges of the day um the issues at hand make us forget about that dream and so i would say let's keep that abundance mindset we know there will be challenges we know uh struggles still exist we know inequities will still be there um but if we hope on and dream on we can build uh the system and as long as we we agree that we know that as uh that racism has a cost on us all but when we invest in equity and justice every last one of us benefits so let's not lose sight of investing um, in, in justice work because justice work is inclusive work. Justice work is prosperity uh, and prosperity means a brighter future and, and we're closer to the dream that we have for what we want to see. So just keep the faith. And, and I'll just be very, very brief since I know that we are, we are at time, but uh, again, also echoing Devante, Skylar, really appreciate the opportunity. 
uh, to join Lauren, Vanna, and the whole Prosperity Now team as well for this session. Um, I think, you know, we are at a very, uh, um, you know, exciting point in time with the, um, you know, signage of the American Rescue Plan Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law. I think, um, you know, state, local governments across the country really have an opportunity to intentionally use these funds to support a truly equitable recovery and address a lot of the health and economic disparities in the most underserved communities across the country. So I'll, I'll stop there because I know we're at time, but again, just thank you so much. And of course, absolutely um, also to folks on the phone, please engage with your local officials. Um, I know that they are very, very passionate about su supporting their residents, their constituents as well, but, but thank you again. Thank you, panelists. And thank you to our audience for joining us for Camp Prosperity 2022. You all have a great rest of your day and uh, thanks again.